today we're talking about the practical uses of AI in banking. I'm here with Vikas Sharma, Head of Banking Analytics at EXL. Vikas, thanks for joining me today. Thank you for your time today, Daniel. So let's just jump right into this. How should banks decide where using AI makes sense? That's an amazing question, Daniel, because there can be so many use cases that banks have. I've seen a few clients using this amazing framework to prioritize these use cases. This framework has three dimensions. The first dimension is impact. What kind of value this use case can create for the organization. The second dimension is certainty of outcome. How confident we are that this value will get created for the organization. Typically, we have seen the more time we spend upfront in investigating the use case, the higher the certainty of outcome is. The third dimension is time to execute. How long will it take for us to realize the value for the organizations? And as you would have guessed, any use case which is creating higher impact has a higher certainty of outcome and requires lower time to execute, will get prioritized first. Makes sense. Where do you see Gen AI use cases working best in banking and finance? So one of the biggest advantages of using Gen AI is being able to ingest a lot of unstructured data sitting within the organization. And by extension of that, we believe operations is going to be the first area which starts using a lot of Gen AI use cases. And slowly it will expand to other functional areas within the bank. Within operations also, we believe there are going to be three generations of Gen AI use cases. The first generation will be focused on internal efficiency. This is where Gen AI will be used to go and transform a lot of middle office and back office functions within the bank. Just to give you an example, banks ingest a lot of documents from customers at the time of onboarding. Right? Gen AI will be used to ingest these documents in an automated manner. Or it will be used to go and fast track your KYC and AML investigations. The second generation will revolve around what we call as rep efficiency. This is where Gen AI will be able to assist your frontline staff people who are interacting with the end customers. AI will be able to give them nudges around the uh, right procedure to follow for a particular request, the right disclosures to share with the end customer, or in many cases, even nudging them to share with the customer what the next best action could look like. The third set of use cases will revolve around customer facing functions. Right now, we do believe, based on the maturity of the technology today, uh, mostly banks are using it for creating smarter chatbots to address some of the frequently asked questions or FAQs from the customers. But as the technology matures more, we will see a lot of Gen AI chatbots and a lot of Gen AI agents interacting directly with the end customers as well. So Vikas, where would you say we are in the adoption phase here? And where would you say adoption is low but could benefit from AI? Right now, I would say we are in the early stages of adoption here. Uh, we have seen clients running a lot of pilots last year, and now we are starting to see where they are entering to productions. Uh, one of the areas where I do think Gen AI will actually create a huge impact is going to be around compliance function within the bank. Most people believe AI creates more compliance issues, um, but we practically tell our clients that this can help you create more automated controls. When you look at control function today at banks, most banks have it manual. Right? And that's why they have to work with a sample of interactions to be able to understand whether all the policies are being followed or not. Now imagine if you had an AI which could automate all of this, which could enable you to scale this to 100% of all the interactions and make it an always on capability, uh, which is scanning for all the anomalies, all the infections within the system. At that level, then you can go and create, use AI to start creating much better controls. An example I'll share with you is around one of the common areas which most banks struggle with. This is around marketing misrepresentation. Imagine one salesperson within the organization who is over promising the benefit to the end customers. Today you have an ability to go and listen to the call that the salesperson is having with the end customer, understand what is being promised compared to what is there actually in the product manual, and then flag cases wherever the salesperson is over promising. Your compliance department can take a look at that and within 24 hours can take a corrective action. So that's how AI is actually enabling you to create much better controls for the future. So you touched on my next question here talking about compliance because I think that that's something that the banks are constantly thinking about, and I think that there's a fear that AI 
you know, puts them in some risk of being compliant. So I know you just gave an example of, you know, it, it working to actually help compliance. But when you're thinking about it, what do you say to the bank that says, like, you know, is it going to be difficult for me to stay in compliance? What what What's the answer there? I genuinely believe there's no alternative where banks are not using AI. Uh, and you are right. AI models can have a lot of biases, a lot of hallucinations. They have a lower shelf life as well. So banks need to design appropriate controls uh, to be able to use these AI models. Typically, we have seen that banks are putting in controls at three places. The first place is around the development stage itself. So whenever these AI models are being developed, they have a lot of controls to ensure that right data is being used for these models. And these models are not creating any discrimination against any protected classes. The second stage where controls get put in is around the approval stage. This is where most banks uh, create a committee which has representation from legal and compliance to ensure these models are being used for the right purpose. They also define the permissible purpose for the model as well to ensure that it's not being used for any other decisioning within the organization. The third place where they use control is around the production stage. This is where banks are investing in putting in a lot of monitoring mechanisms so that they can understand whenever these models are degrading, whenever they start showing difference in performance, and then they can come in and quickly replace these models with new ones. And that's how banks are able to go and have a better control around the entire AI model suite that they're putting into production. So all that is really good advice. It makes a lot of sense. If you had to pick the most important thing that the banks need to do to have a good, successful AI program, what would it be? I would say they do need multiple things to do that. And typically we have seen that there is a framework which has four pillars to create an AI program. The first pillar is defining the AI agenda for the organization. Right? As you can imagine, doing this in silos in different departments within the organization is going to be very, very difficult. So we have seen many of our clients basically manage their AI agenda at a central level to prioritize the use cases which will create maximum value for the organization. Right? The second big pillar is going to be data and infra readiness. Right? These AI models require very different kind of tech stack uh, than traditional models required. Right? Their computer comments are going to be very, very different, especially when you start using a lot of Gen AI models. Right? So banks need to invest in right capabilities to be able to use these models into their processes. The third place where they need to invest a lot is going to be around talent. Right? And this is where they need to take a look at their org structure first. And do they manage it at a central level? Do they give it to different functions to run it? Or they create a hybrid approach within the organizations? The second place is going to be around upskilling their teams as well. Right? In many cases, they would need to retrain some of their existing staff because so they need to hire new talent, which is not just AI scientists, but also in terms of data engineers to put these models into production as well. And the fourth place where they will need to invest a lot is going to be around creating better and robust monitoring around these models so that they are able to go and make best use of these. Vikas, thank you so much for joining us today and for sharing your insights. Thanks a lot for your time today, Daniel.